jump this uh, building movement dialogue off. Uh, welcome. My name is RJ McConney. I'm the co-producer of Foundry Theater. Uh, this is part of a series called Devising Freedom, uh, where we're looking at uh, the prison industrial complex, uh, past, present, and hopefully something else uh, that's in front of it that uh, actually leaves us safe, actually leaves us free, um, all of that. Uh, for uh, this dialogue tonight, um, our moderator is Michael Primo, yes. right here. Thank you. Um, no, we're gonna. What we're gonna do is, um, after I introduce Michael, we're going to play a short video. Then we'll bring these front lights up. Um, it's all right. So uh, Michael's a great moderator for us because. Uh, He's, he's both in the theater making world. Uh, he's currently the producer's chair with the Foundry Theater. Uh, right now he's doing work uh, called Sandy Storyline, um, which is facilitating people telling their stories, their experiences around Hurricane Sandy. Uh, but it's also something that uh, can be applied across, you know, across experiences. Um, and then on the other half of it, uh, Michael's very, been very involved in different uh, campaign work, movement building, and bridging uh, the arts and social justice work. Uh, so thanks for being here with us, Michael. Yeah, it's good to be here. Should we jump the video off first? And then yeah. Maybe? Okay, so I'll do that. Great. Believe it or not. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll make this a, as much of a dialogue and as a conversation as possible um, um, so that we can really kind of dig in it. We have a, a wonderful uh, audience of, of lots of familiar faces, so I, I think uh, we'll have ample opportunity to kind of dig in and, and uh, go deep with it. Um, to my left here is uh, Gabriel Sayo, Sayo, Sayo. Sorry. Um, from the uh, Drug Policy Alliance, um, uh, Julian Kang. From uh, the uh, who is currently the director of Communities United for Police Reform, and uh, Rachel Herzig, who is uh, the campaign director of uh, Critical Resistance. Um, and um, once we get going, I'll allow them to introduce themselves and talk more about the the work that they do. Um, and uh, right now, we'll, we'll have a video. <laughs> <laughs> you, you all know how this goes. <laughs> Yeah, so let, we can start off inter introducing yourselves, and it, it, if the video comes on, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a break for that. Is that okay? Sure. I think we're good. We're good? We're good. We're good. We're good. Yeah, we're good. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yay. I've been stopped by police after I became a cop. We used to walk to Washington Heights with two other cops running around. Believe it or not, I've been stopped by police after I became a cop. We used to walk to Washington Heights with two other cops, friend of mine, and we would get got thrown against the wall just for walking down. I, I'm not saying don't stop the criminal. I say don't stop the innocent people. Del Polanco, I've been a police officer since uh, 2005. Came to New York, I was 10. Uh, came from a third world country, the Dominican Republic. I grew up in Washington Heights. Those shootings almost every night, it was a daily thing. The 34th precinct used to have a cop come into uh, my sixth grade class 
She used to come every Wednesday and I used to look up to her like, oh my God, this is what I want to do. I mean, this is what I not told my father. I think I want to be a cop. For me, it was a dream. In 2009, uh, the commanding officers required us to have a 120 and 5 quota system. 120 and 5 means one arrest per month, uh, 20 summonses per month, and five stop question and frisk. So basically, they wanted to stop at least one person a day. But what happened the day you don't see the crime? What happened the day you don't see the violations? People start getting creative. We will stop a person in the street in the corner because um, the sergeant says stop him. Why? You don't ask. You stop him, you frisk him, you see if it's possible you search him. In this case, sometimes they're just walking home from school, they just walk into the store, they just, they're not doing absolutely anything. They're not doing absolutely anything. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a really humiliating feeling. When they go through your pockets, when they stop you, you don't have no freedom. If you stop and then tell the officer, I'm not, I don't have to give you my ID, I don't have to give you my name, which is within the law, the law allows you to do that, you're going to get hurt. In the Bronx, you're going to get hurt. My turning point was with uh, a bunch of kids in a corner, stopped by the commanding officer. There was a 13-year-old mix in the group, uh, Blanco Coffin. I said, for what? Coffin, you don't ask me a question, Coffin, bring him back. Um, his brother come to ask what was going on with my brother. He's walking home from school. Officer, did he do anything stupid? Uh, the commanding officer looked at my partner and told him, cuff him too, bring him in. For what? Oh, we will figure it out later. Just bring him in. And that was my turning point. That was the time I said, you know what? What should I do to a kid that's just walking home from school? That we know is not doing anything. What should I do? That this is not what I became a cop for. This is not what I wanted to do. I live for my kids. I, and I think of them. I think of them one day being being slapped by a cop, like it happened so many times in the street. I'm thinking of them being handcuffed and screaming to the cop, well, I haven't done anything, I haven't done anything. What are you, why are you arresting me? I haven't done anything. I don't want them to go through that. If you get violated by a cop, how are you gonna trust that cop? How are you gonna come up to him when you see something if this is the same cop that threw me against the wall, and this is the same cop that went through my private parts looking for crack that I didn't have, why should I help him? You should be working with the community. It's written like that. You should be getting community trust. There's a lot of things that can make the community safer. Stopping and harassing innocent people is not going to make the community safer. Again, thank you, thank you for coming. Um, this particular issue is something that's also personal to me, and I just want to frame that um, as well. You know, as as a brown body growing up, getting knocked around by police. Um, last spring, I was on trial for my political activity, and looking at seven years, um, um, and the police straight lied every step of the way, and was only acquitted in front of a uh, jury. Um, and, uh, there's, uh, my lawyer said this, her mentor had said to her that once that, uh, there may not be any justice in a, the justice system, but you can occasionally find it in a jury. Um, and that was, that was after st straight lies, just down the line. And it was only acquitted because of video evidence. So I think it's a, it's a, just a useful analogy, um, or story to think about the amount of people that get locked up that don't have that privilege that I did of having a video or having um, pro bono legal support that was competent, um, you know. So it's a, it's a pleasure to sit and build with these folks and, and you uh, here who came out here today to talk about this. Um, we have three people who kind of approach this issue um, from um, a variety of directions, which I think presents a rich opportunity for us to really kind of think about how we build a movement um, within uh, this space reacting to uh, what you know can variously be called 
uh, punitive forms of justice um, that are really, you know, meant to keep us in check in a lot of ways. Um, so I'm going to invite um, our guests here to introduce themselves and the work they do, and then uh, we can move into a, a discussion around how these particular issues that they work on intersect um, so we can collectively uh, think together as we build together. Um, my name is Gabriel Sam. I'm the, um, I work at the Drug Policy Alliance. It's my colleagues. Um, I'll say it louder. Uh, my name is Gabriel Sam. I work at the Drug Policy Alliance, and I see some of my colleagues and former colleagues here, which is nice. Uh, we're a national organization of people working to end the war on drugs. We're based here in New York. We have offices around the country. Uh, the team that I work with here in New York focuses on changing um, policies and practices here in New York City. Uh, in Albany for statewide action or activities, or policies, and so forth, but also in jurisdictions around the state. So we're increasingly working in cities like the city of Albany, not just the legislature, thankfully, um, and Buffalo and Ithaca and other uh, places. And so the work ranges from things like sentencing reform issues to syringe access and syringe exchange, overdose prevention to effective youth drug education programs, um, a lot of work around marijuana policy specifically, which I can speak more about later, uh, but it runs the, the gamut. And we work in actually in coalition with groups who are part of CPR, which Tom will talk about, and have worked with critical resistance, and, um, and I'm really pleased to be here. I'm Ju Hyun, and I work with Communities United for Police Reform, and I see that um, some of my bosses are in the room, um, <laughs> and the leadership of our campaign. Uh, we're a multi-sector, a uh, multi-strategy campaign around the city that includes a uh, number of different types of organizations, including grassroots community-based organizations, legal shops that do litigation, policy advocacy groups, researchers. Um, but most importantly, our leadership is really uh, grassroots groups that are coming from affected communities. Um, and so I see some pictures of homeless folks in the room and other people. Um, and uh, one of the things that we really try to do is build together uh, a multi-strategy campaign that doesn't include not, on, not only um, community education and community organizing, but also really uh, some policy advocacy, litigation, um, communications, and some other stuff to bring it all together. And I'll talk more about it in a minute. I'm Rachel Herzing. Um, I work with an organization called Critical Resistance. And we have a chapter here in uh, New York City, but we work at a national scale. Um, chapters also in Portland, in Oakland, in Los Angeles, and in New Orleans. And um, the organization is dedicated to trying to figure out how to eliminate the prison industrial complex entirely. And we do that through campaigns and projects on the ground that I'll talk about at one length. That's great. I think um, a lot of times in this work, there's a lot of there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of words that we use collectively, and sometimes we know what they mean, and sometimes we pretend like we know what they mean. Um, I'm, I'm curious if we could speak to this word movement uh, a little bit, and I'm curious um, how um, the three of you, uh, in particular, define movement and what a healthy movement looks like. Um, and then in that question, I'm wondering if you could also sort of um, use that as an opportunity to talk a little bit about your work and how you might, um, how that relates to sort of um, strengthening the work you do by working with other folks in the sector or perhaps not out of the sector. Um, I think for us within Community United for Police Reform, and certainly folks in the audience should correct me, um, but we think about movement in a few different ways, and one of them being really the coordination of different strategies in different sectors or areas. Um, so all around a common goal that we're trying to achieve together. And for us, that means that CPR is a campaign that's part of that, trying to build a much broader movement. So meaning that people, ideally, that it's mass enough and big enough so that people who are not parts of organizations feel like they're part of something broader and bigger. And I think we saw some of that um, in the past year, in 2013 in New York City. One of the things that I think um, happened in the past year, a number of different things happened. One thing that I would uh, name is that in the 2013 citywide elections, you couldn't go to any kind of mayoral debate or citywide debate without hearing the words stop and frisk or hearing the words NYPD abuse. And that was not coming only from members of our member organizations. That was coming from the general public because there was a groundswell of recognition that the NYPD was systemically discriminate, discriminating and abusing people. Um, the city. And so in that way, for me, that's part of what part of a movement looks like. 
Another example I would point to in the last year is that um, there's been, I would argue, some cultural change in New York. Uh, five years ago, it was real hard to go anywhere in the city. Well, let me, let me put it more positively. Last year, um, I think that when there were instances of, of police abuse on the streets, so whether that was the killing of 16-year-old Kamani Gray in Brooklyn, uh, you couldn't go anywhere and not have people come out of their stores with their phones in their hands, mm -hmm. taping the incident as it was happening. And that's not something we saw in New York City streets five years ago. So part of what we've tried to do is, through multiple strategies, build a real system and culture of accountability and love, meaning that our jobs on the street is to create safety in part by looking out for each other. So that if I see somebody on my block who's being hassled by the cops, that I serve as witness there. That if I don't feel safe to take out my phone as a camera, that I'm still observing so I can be a witness for them later. That they know that they're not alone in that moment when being abused. And these are things that we can all do on a daily basis. And I think more and more New Yorkers who have never been part of an organization are actually starting to do this. And for me, that's kind of the semblance of what a movement starts to look like. I, the, the changes that Ju Hyun is naming that happened here in New York City are, I think, fairly profound, and we probably won't be able to fully appreciate it for a while until we have some sort of historical perspective. I mean, some of us, I think, will appreciate it now, but I think the, the full weight of the significance of having this type of shift is something that may take us a while to really digest. Because if you think back, you know, 20 years ago, um, or even 10, the, at the, the national conversation around these issues, to the extent that there even was one, was largely defined by things like getting tough on crime, uh, by uh, uh, getting criminals or drugs off of our streets or out of our communities. Um, something that, uh, um, uh, you know, that we, we will sometimes use in terminology like the war on drugs or, or a system of mass incarceration. Um, that's been, you know, decades in the making. And so when Nixon launches, a, President Nixon launches a war on drugs in 71, and Reagan builds upon that, and there's this whole expansion of the use of prisons and jails in this country in a way that's unprecedented in humankind or human history, um, to the extent that we have 2.3 million people in prison and jails, which doesn't, is a somewhat meaningless number because I don't think we really comprehend it. it it's... It's like everybody in Manhattan on any given day, um, the people that live here. You know, if you consider there's 10 million people roughly incarcerated in the world, that 5% of that population is here in the U.S., or 25% of that incarcerated population is here in the U.S., it's like, I don't think we begin to digest what that really means. And so to be in an environment where so much of what, uh, anything related to safety or justice, uh, uh, the definitions of, of what that would look like, is so oftentimes related to cages and to police and badges and guns and penalization and criminalization, to now be in a scenario where, as, as, as Ji Hyun noted, you have the election of the mayor of the largest city in the country and one of the largest cities in the world, who wins because he runs on reforming the largest police force in the world, is not something that just arose out of nowhere. It is an expression of a whole bunch of things that have happened that are small and large alike and that are beyond any one, one or two organizations alone. It has to do with a whole range of things. And I think, so to me, like the, the Michael, to your question about like what does movement mean, uh, it's, it's that thing that's really hard to replicate, but we're always trying to get to. Like, we want to get to a thing where we could say, wow, there's a shift happening culturally. There's a shift happening in policy. There's, a, you know, regardless of how limited the reforms may be at the federal level, the fact that there's a president of the United States and an attorney general using the terms mass incarceration, like, it, it's, that is the result of movement, right? You don't get a president to use that term. They didn't just adopt that. They did it because folks worked for years in isolation and obscurity and ignored and against great odds to popularize a term that's now being normalized and mainstreamed by the president. So I don't want to overstate what that means. It doesn't mean we don't have a problem, but we also shouldn't understate the value of that and, and what it reflects. And I think that 
I want to get to those more of those things that are about transforming cultural, political, economic circumstances that I don't know a formula to do that other than doing the work in conjunction with a lot of other people in a lot of other places doing the same thing uh, or, or doing their own thing, but in a way where we say, like, oh, let's keep this thing moving, moving along. But I, that's what most inspires me right now about where we are is the, uh, whether we're, we're a person who just came into this and said, oh, look at all these problems. This is, how did we get here? Or people who have been doing this for 20 years to help us get here. I think it's an exciting moment because there's some opportunities that we hopefully will be able to realize, but they probably won't come without sustained organizing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I was going to start in a different place, but sitting in this room um, actually is a good example of movement building mm -hmm. to me because I'm seeing all kind of people that I worked with while I lived here. 15 odd years ago and whatever that was. And people who I have worked with since that time in a variety of sectors. So some people on imprisonment, some people on policing, some people on like cultural work or putting out um, a, a periodical, some people on anti-violence, right? So it's really, really interesting to me to be sitting in this room because I think it's a reflection of also the ways in which the organization that I work for has this kind of big tent approach to doing our work, right? So I was on the way down here walking past, uh, I walked past the Quaker house in like 13th and 2nd, Friends, the Friends building. And I haven't been by that building in a very long time, but that was the office for a conference that we held here called Critical Resistance East, CR East, back in 2001. And that was one of two kind of convenings that helped start our organization. There was another one, 1998, in Berkeley, and then this one here. The office was here, and we held it uptown at Columbia. And those were really to do a couple things. The first one and the second one, really to kind of take a temperature of the mm -hmm. landscape of organizing, activism, but also what is the changing nature of the prison industrial complex 10 years on, 20 years on, since a lot of people had gotten together before. And also to figure out, okay, in the room together, what can we do to imagine what kind of taking this thing out at its knees might look like and require. And out of those um, convenings, we actually got enough push that we decided to form ourselves into an organization, right? So we had been kind of a collection of individuals working in different ways across the United States, largely convening based, and we understood that we were hearing from people inside of that work that they wanted a bit more infrastructure and a container that could sustain over time some of the ideas that had gotten raised there and a more concrete way to apply that to work on the ground. So we have a value, the people who started the organization, we had a value on organization, right? So rather than a collective of individuals, which sometimes can be really useful, also the utility of organizations and then organizations joining forces and kind of scaling out that way. And so we've been at that as an organization for the past 13 years. And we have a very, very broad vision of abolishing the prison industrial complex. And I actually want to define how I use that because I feel like that's one of those ones that people use a lot. Um, and so I wrote down the one I like the best that I've been using recently so I don't get it wrong. But, um, when I'm talking about it, what I normally mean is the symbiotic relationship between public and private. Public is important in this, not just private. Interests that employ imprisonment, policing, surveillance, the courts, and their attendant cultural apparatuses um, as a means of maintaining social, economic, political inequities. So I'm not talking about mass incarceration only. Large-scale imprisonment is certainly a piece of the, of the puzzle. I am not talking about private industries making a profit. That is certainly a piece of the puzzle, but state entities are also um, benefiting substantially by the setup of this thing. I am talking about kind of the 
the complex part of it, right? That's what I'm the most interested in, is the kind of intersection and the symbiotic nature of all of that that gets employed to make us think we need cops to stay safe, even if they're good cops, right? Or we need cages, even, you know, for cages for the really, really bad people and that we can't think of anything else because our purview gets so tight and so cramped that we forget to dream, or we forget we have the ability to dream. And so the organization that I work for is really an organization of dreamers. And at some level, that's our power, right? To be able to think about the myriad ways that this monster um, attacks us and tries to kill us, right? And that can be really, really daunting. It can be a challenge. But it's also an incredible opportunity to connect in all of these different ways, right? So it's really important to us that Picture the Homeless does the work that y'all do because we understand the relationship between people being displaced and pushed out and gentrification and who winds up in cages, right? And it's really, really important that people at Drug Policy Alliance are trying to figure out how to mitigate the harm of the war on drugs that is like a really core part of the killing machine and to try to figure out how to keep those people out of cages, right? And it's really, really important that CPR does the work the campaign is doing because out without kind of any kind of remedy between the hands of the cops and bodies on the streets, we see what happens, right? And so the whole kind of picture is important to us and it's really a, a unique opportunity for us to work with organizations that focus more on a specific thing so that we can maintain a broader focus. So we work nationally, like I said, we have chapters in these different places, but the idea is to also work locally. So the individual chapters uh, identify and work on some of the articulations of the prison industrial complex that are the most particular to where they are, the most acute are, are a good fight. They pick good fights that are local. And then we look at those all together to see how are, how are we sharing strategies, how are we fighting the, the beast at kind of all of these levels. And so for me, movement is a little bit of like the family that we have, how we recognize each other, right, um, from the places that we work, but it's also our ability to kind of operate at different scales um, and in different ways. That's great. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, and that's also a great um, segue to a question I was going to ask a little bit later, but I think it's a, it's a perfect way to kind of uh, frame it. And building on what you're talking about in terms of like looking forward, the dreamer aspect, right? Um, so, and you touched on, you know, 1971, 72, early 70s being the beginning of the war on drugs. You know, around that time it was also um, when the Powell memo, memo was written, which is that document considered to be sort of the framing document of what would become neoliberal capitalism, which definitely is the sort of economic sort of like foundation of many of these social problems, these approach to what would otherwise be health problems perhaps if we lived in a different world. And so I'm curious if you could um, share with us as you look ahead, so we'll use 40, since the Powell Memo and the, the war on drugs was about 40 years ago now, looking ahead to 40 years from now um, with an eye towards movement building, what does winning look like? What, how is the world different because of a change in, in drug policy and a change in policing and a change in prisons? What does that look different? How do things look differently? And how, and, and I'm curious if you could relate that to your particular immediate struggles, like how that sort of helps you uh, focus the work that you do. This is for all of you. Yeah, for all of you, please. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this is the easy questions. Um, <laughs> In a, in, a, in, a, in a general way, I tend to, st I, when I think about questions like this, I tend to think about the stuff like this in, where there's an, it's an absence of, which I think is part of a, probably a problem, right? There's an absence of um, social control. There's an absence of poverty. There's an, like, it's, it's interesting. Um, to say the least. Right? Um, I mean, I, more specifically with respect to drugs, uh, the, one of the things that interests me so much about, about drugs and drug policy, aside from a lot of personal uh, experiences that are probably familiar to many of us in many, in many ways, 
is the um, our ability to control our own consciousness and transform or alter that consciousness at will. And what role, if any, should the state have in mitigating a, uh, anybody's ability or, if you want to use a term right, to change or alter their consciousness? And, uh, and that's a big question for me around drug policy issues, right? It's not, I'm actually not interested in trying to get everybody who's got a problem with drugs into treatment. I mean, most people who have a problem with drugs don't need treatment. Most people don't, treatment is more of a problem for people than it is a help. Some people need it, they should have it. Most people have a problem with drugs, they, should, they come out of it on their own, including young people. The, the bigger question is, do we have the ability to um, uh, have control over our own bodies? Put inside of our bodies what we want, change our consciousness in a way that we want um, uh, absent harm to other people. And that, uh, uh, you know, is more of an interesting, compelling thing for me. I mean, I certainly think about a place where everyone has the, the opportunity to achieve their full potential, whatever that may be, under conditions that are most advantageous to them and their community. And, um, you know, basic things, housing, food, you know, stuff like that, is of course a part of that, but it's also about joy and pleasure. Mm -hmm. And can do we, I mean, so 40 years from now, I would like to live in a society where joy and pleasure are as much a part of um, uh, something that we have as a fundamental piece of our humanity as is food and housing. And, um, and when I think about the organizing work that we do um, to try to change, you know, whether it's changing policies or changing laws or whatnot, uh, it's, u it's usually, or, or if not always, driven by, um, are, we, are we increasing the number of people who feel compelled, or who feel, I, rather than compelled, um, who feel situated in their own personal power to make decisions in conjunction with other people to pursue sort of righteous end with each other. And if we end up doing, whether it's a policy reform thing or, or a coalition thing or an organizing thing, it's always something, there's always something fundamental about that. Like, are we building out, are there more people who feel capable of engaging and organizing for justice? And I think, I think ultimately where I'd like to be in 40 years is in a place that's defined by a process like that where people can come together and say, this is, we are living in a place that we all help define and build together. Right. And I think maybe that maybe that's one reason why I, th I tend to think about these things like in the absence of, like as a starting point. That's also just a limitation in my own thinking. I think. But um, like I like stuff like this. Like when we're when we're getting together in places like this, or you know, going to events or working with folks in, in uh, groups to try to change things. Like it. I was at a thing recently where Gene Gene's Jean, sitting here from Picture the Homeless was just breaking it down about how Picture the Homeless came about. And I was like, man, I'm, this is. It's like more of that stuff about how organizations build and grow together. It's like where I'd like to be in 40 years is in a place where there's more people doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. right? And I don't know exactly what that looks like other than like an absence of certain things. But certainly more of that. Right? Like more of those, the histories of the pictures of the homelesses. And the, like, I want more of that in 40 years. Mm -hmm. I think what I want to start... Uh, by saying is that I'm just really loving the conversation. I kind of want to just ask both of you a bunch of questions, but that's really selfish. <laughs> um, and so first, I, I also actually want to ask two questions of you all as the audience, just because we don't get to really know you during this as much. Um, so one question is, um, how many of you are artists? And how many of you believe in liberation? Wow, less liberation than art. Um, <laughs> that's already, that's already <laughs> something. So I'm starting with that in part because I kind of want to go to answer the question. I want to kind of go backwards and then forwards. So backwards, if we go to the 70s, I think the other thing that happens in the 70s in this country is really serious, um, systematic disinvestment in public infrastructure. And what I mean by that is that you know, the public schools get disinvested in, we disinvest in health care, so it becomes not only more privatized, but really nobody can afford it. Uh, we disinvest in actually ho public housing or any kind of housing that's affordable, and we create basically the, um, we, we dismantle anything that's 
looking like something like a social safety net. And I feel like that's such an important backdrop for us in terms of understanding where we are now and why we have something called the prison industrial complex that's so embedded in every part of the apparatus in this country, the way that Rachel described. Um, then if we move forward a few decades to, um, let's say the 90s, mid 90s, and I'll use uh, policing as one entry point, not to say it's the end all, but just one window to look into. In the mid 90s, um, we were in a city that were, where the NYPD was killing young men of color pretty regularly with impunity, um, or without impunity. I never get those words right. Um, but basically without any kind of accountability. And so we can name many of those names in this room, I'm sure, Anthony Baez, um, uh, Patrick Dorisman, there's many, many, um, uh, Anthony Rosario, Hilton Vega, Yong Chin Huang, the list goes on. And we go into the late 90s and it continues. Um, and then some of these names become more nationally recognized. So the torture of Abner Luima, uh, the killing of Amadou Diallo with 41 shots. And at that point in the late 90s, early 2000s, nationally, there's a conversation that's happening where at the highest levels of government and in people's uh, living rooms or what have you, people are talking about racial profiling and how it's probably a bad idea. Um, and I say that sort of jokingly, but not. It's an incredibly <coughs> serious issue. But what we saw was that, uh, ironically, in 2001, there was a world conference against racism um, that actually many organizations um, throughout the U.S. and also around the world participated in. Coming back from the World Conference Against Racism in Durban uh, is when 9-11 happened. And after that, it became pretty impossible for a good period of time to publicly criticize law enforcement with any kind of credibility for a number of different reasons. And I'm not saying that lives should not be more, uh, lives lost should be mourned. Um, uh, but the conversations that were possible at that time as surveillance just exploded, uh, changed our context for almost a decade probably. So in New York City, using this location as one example, we shoot forward to the late 2000s and the killing of Sean Bell right before his wedding um, with 50 shots. And at that point, we're not even shocked by 50 shots anymore because the number of shots no longer mean anything to us. Yeah. And so... That's, in some ways, some of the resurgence of the local police accountability movement um, in that period of recognizing that, you know what, enough is enough. We really have to move past and try to attack what this monster is, as Rachel described it. Um, and we're moving forward to now, and we're in a moment, so today, um, how many of you have heard of Cicely McMillan? So Occupy Wall Street, it happened in New York, was one of the places it happened. Um, she was an Occupy Wall Street protester who was groped and basically sexually assaulted by an NYPD officer. Her right breast was groped. Um, she went to trial. Uh, she was convicted at trial. Sentencing was today. Um, it could have been up to seven years. It ended up being three months uh, and five years probation. And we can debate what the merits or what's wrong with that verdict, et cetera, et cetera. But that, in some ways, I want to juxtapose that, um, that instance of today and that injustice with um, Ramarley Graham. How many of you have heard of Ramarley Graham? Mm -hmm. So young man uh, in the Bronx, he was um, killed when he was, I guess, 18. Um, two years ago, he was walking home. Uh, he actually got home, went upstairs mm -hmm. in his uh, mother's house, and he had been profiled by some cops on a corner who claimed that they thought he might have a gun or a weapon because he might have adjusted his waistband. Now, I don't know about you, but even when I'm wearing a belt, I adjust my waistband. But it's really unlucky that I'm being profiled that way. Um, and so cops actually went into his home without a search warrant, busted in, killed him in front of his six-year-old brother and his grandmother. Um, they claimed they might have found a small amount of weed in the bathtub or something or in, the, in the toilet. But all to say that there was no gun. They claimed he ran. In fact, they planted evidence or planted um, a news story of a young black man running, which wasn't from Marley, uh, claiming that he ran. And so there's a series of injustices with this case, which actually the Bronx uh, District Attorney convened a grand jury in this case. The first grand jury voted to indict the officer involved. Um, that was thrown out on a technicality by the judge. A second grand jury was convened, which almost never happens, but happens because of community pressure. And that second grand jury did not vote to indict. 
Sure. So at this point, the family only has the Department of Justice to look at for a quote-unquote criminal justice solution. Um, so anyway, I'm raising that because there's a big petition drive to try to get the DOJ to do a full investigation, but also because this is a case, these are two different cases that are part of the same monster. Um, and there's actually pretty differential media coverage of this, not surprisingly. And I don't blame Sicily, and we shouldn't, I don't think, blame Sicily for this, but it shows what it means. Um, and you shared your story earlier of what it was, uh, that you were fortunate enough to have good counsel to be able to do, um, to go to trial. Uh, and not everybody does. And so part of the system we're in is one where we're still seeing uh, young people basically being killed by police without any accountability, without any system of accountability. Um, and so our work in terms of the local police accountability work has just begun. Uh, we have a lot more to do, but I, I guess in part I raise these because I think that when we move forward 40 years, where we need to be I think is whatever we dream right now. Mm -hmm. And that we need to actually not only have those dreams 40 years from now, but we need to be dreaming today how we act today to enable that future in a really concrete way. I mean, organizations, a lot of organizations talk about quote unquote strategic plans or like three year plans or five year plans. I feel like we need a movement plan, like a multi-decade movement plan where we all actually carve out, you know what, these are some things we're gonna do and we take it with that much seriousness. The level of resources that many individual organizations put into strategic, strategic planning or whatever, financial controls, blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying that's not important, it's important, fine. But we need to actually put that level of intentionality into a multi-decade plan to build not only a movement, but to win. To really not only win certain reforms, which, you know, Community Unite for Police Reform worked with a number of organizations to support the council that <coughs> passed two pieces of legislation last year. That's great, it's not enough. We've got way more to do and I just hope, and part of my dream is that we not only dream about like, being able to envision ourselves with joy and pleasure, but also that we are so intentional that we can't lose. Um, and I feel like that's the irresistibility factor that we have to, I don't know about infect ourselves, but we have to make sure that everybody around us knows how irresistible it is that we're gonna have a different future and we're gonna create it now. The freedom plan. The freedom plan. <laughs> so what winning looks like to me is self-determination. That's an easy answer. That's what winning looks like. Mm -hmm. um, where we are in 40 years is more complicated. <laughs> and I was so astounded to hear you, you like lay out the, you know, and then in September, September 11, things changed, yeah. you know, because I tell that all the time about policing, because it's true about policing in New York, but it's also true about the prison system in general, right? Um, and about police forces across the United States. So, um, you know, one thing that happened right after September 11th is that they locked down all the prisons in, in, in the country. Most every prison got locked down for some period of time, right? Um, and like, no legal visits, like nothing, right? Um, but the other thing that happened was a little piece of legislation called the Patriot Act. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never right? heard of it. <laughs> that was a leftover, right? from the AADPA, the oh, okay. effective, what is it called? Yeah. Um, Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act, the Oklahoma City, right? Yeah. So. Um, and so I think, you know, one of, the, one of the things that, like, that trajectory that you laid out, but also kind of these lingering pieces, um, makes me think about is exactly what you were talking about, the end of, of what you were saying, which is, like, acting on our dreams right now, right? So one of the things that I think is really compelling for us and one of the roles that we try to play in coalitions, and we work almost exclusively in coalition because nobody wants to work with abolitionists alone, right? <laughs> you know, it, um, is why not ask for what we want instead of what we think we can get or what we're told we're entitled to, right? Why not just ask for what we want? And some of the stories we were hearing right before we started talking are like, well, no, we want this thing, right? And so we start acting as if, right? Um, and I think that that is a, is a part of what I would like to be seeing also in, the, in like when I look at the next 40 years is that I feel like there's been such a chill put on dissent for very obvious reasons. I think, Michael, your, your story's a good one, right? Um, 
and you know the organization that I'm part of was founded in part by you know former Black Panthers, former Black Liberation Army um, members, and you know the kind of cautions against uh, being cowed by the chill of the state um, and the repression of the state of dissent, I think is really, really key. And dissent can look a bunch of different ways, right? So there are a lot of ways to kind of move together and, and use different strategies and tactics to get there. But the, the dreaming part, the kind of continuing to push out and think longer, um, I think is really, really, really important. And when they continue to trade off, to prioritize cops, and to prioritize cages, I think it really does curb our ability to manage mm -hmm. what else. But it also takes um, different alternatives off the table, mm -hmm. right? So if all the resources, I'm not just talking about financial resources, but if all the resources are going toward caging and controlling, it makes it impossible for resources, in some cases, to also be put toward joy and pleasure and liberation and self-determination. So. For me, yeah, 40 years, it's like, let's start really acting on, I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on the plan. Hold, hold me down with the plan because I, I'm, I'm there. And I think it'll take that long. I think that's the other thing, is to think in decades, right? So part of the professionalization of our, of our movements has been to think in year increments, right? Um, and I think we know stuff doesn't happen in 12 months like that, right? <laughs> so I, I like that it's like decades long and to kind of readjust our expectations away from those kind of what we can get in a legislative cycle or what we can get in a funding cycle or what we can get, you know. I think that's part of it. I agree with you. Like these pieces of legislation matter. And, you know, aggregate, they matter a lot, right? But that's a piece. And what is underneath when your piece of legislation passes to make sure that something actually happens with it and that it wasn't just like a victory for, you know, a moment. Yeah, nothing, nothing builds movements like a plan, like vision, right? Mm -hmm. 40 years ago, I guess we called a manifesto. I don't know what we'll call it in 40 years from now. It'd be interesting to see. Um, before I turn it out to the audience um, and, and invite uh, your questions in this conversation, um, I want to um, also honor this space by, by asking a question about art and culture and stories and, and the role of that work in your work. Um, and, I, and I'm curious for... Um, um, situating this in how you're looking at your work moving forward, like um, we've talked sort of where we've come from, we've talked far ahead, you know, and I'm curious about um, the next, the road ahead of you, however you want to categorize that, a decade, a year, a month, a day, I'm trying to get to the weekend personally, <laughs> so, you know, however you want to think about that is, is, is cool, um, but I, I'm curious of that role, the role of stories the role of art, the role of culture in your work. I know, Rachel, you've worked a lot with stories, and mm -hmm. you were talking a little about this about this earlier, but um, especially from the perspective of, of, of engaging with artists, engaging with people who identify themselves as, as art makers, but not necessarily. Like, art and culture in the widest stretch, you know, we, we communicate our values through culture, we communicate our values through story, and it's all around us, you know? So I'm curious if you could, if you could speak to uh, uh, work that you have coming up, um, campaigns or broader movement work and the role of art and culture if and if you're not if it isn't engaged directly how you would like to see it engaged potentially you know mm -hmm. to a room full of folks who are art are, are makers you saw that right not me not me. <laughs> 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 I, I think I you know, first I would start by saying that uh, we, were, we were actually talking a little bit about this question before, um, so you would think that we would all have prepped answers, but that's not true. Um, but where I would start, I think, is just recognizing that historically most of our community is the resistance movement. That's art. That's actually what has changed people's minds. Like, if you look historically, what changes people's hearts and minds is not somebody talking for 20 minutes about some wacky stuff, but it's about connecting with people's hearts, and that that's actually... It's not just a tactic, it's a strategy, and it's actually part of what movement building has to include and integrate. Having said that, what I will say is for CPR at least, we have a lot more to do on that front. Um, and I would say that that's probably one of our biggest challenges right now in terms of not doing more integration. So pieces like this one that you just saw, the film, um, was produced by uh, Firelight uh, Media, which some of you probably know. Um, they're this amazing filmmakers organization. Um, and part of it was because we need to tell stories. That even in doing things like passing
some legislation, part of what we need to do is be able to tell stories of ourselves, of each other. Um, it's much more effective for uh, this young member from Make the Road New York, whose uh, name is Taekwon, to be able to tell his story in one of another clip that we have, where he was stopped um, over 60 times before he turned 18. To be able to talk about what that was like, what that meant, and how that didn't make the community safer. To hear his mother talking about that story, and for all of us to be sharing some of those stories. Um, so I feel like the storytelling piece is critically important. Some of the ways that we do use um, that we're able to include art within our work right now is actually, I would say, through some narratives. So we do Know Your Rights trainings. Many of our organizations do Know Your Rights trainings in terms of interactions with the police. Um, and a number of groups have done murals, Know Your Rights murals in communities where, um, and Picture of the Homeless worked on one in Harlem, um, and where it's not just the organization, but it's whoever wants to in the community gets together to come help paint this mural that an artist has commissioned to work on and to develop and design. And for us, a lot of that is also about reclaiming public space, to re-envision what safety would look like. Um, the, this is not exactly to your question, but I did want to make a plug for something called um, the Joint Remedies Process, which hopefully will come one day. Um, there was a stop and frisk trial, federal class action lawsuit last year, some of you might have heard of it, um, where basically the NYPD stop and frisk program was deemed unconstitutional by the federal courts. Um, there was a series of remedies ordered by the court. Not one of those things has moved forward yet. Um, it's stuck in court right now. So even though the mayor has said that he has the intent to withdraw his appeal, um, the court hasn't ruled on it, and the police unions are battling it. So um, once that stay is lifted, which I'm actually sure will happen, we have the opportunity to actually dream about what community safety could look like in New York without this abusive stop and frisk program. And that's something that we would want everyone involved in. That's going to require not only folks to think about policy and reform issues, but also think about what it means to be safe in our communities with each other um, and what it means to not have to rely on law enforcement as a primary way to maintain safety. So I want to put that out because I feel like there's a lot of ways to be really creative with that, um, and we really want to help with that. <laughs> Um, I'll give you a handful of examples and I'll try to do it briefly. Um, we do a lot of storytelling and story collecting inside of the organization and it looks a little bit different in different ways. Um, there are three projects that are going on right now that involve um, interviewing or story collecting. One is happening here in New York City um, and the chapter here <coughs> is talking to survivors of Attica prison to just talk about what conditions were like in Attica um, and to help build a case for the state of New York to close down a maximum security prison, right? Um, but also just to kind of add a body of evidence to like what conditions are like and how, what it is to survive those conditions. And Brian is here if you want to talk to him more about that. Um, in Oakland, uh, the, what a, the chapter there um, effectively won a campaign against gang injunctions um, in our coalition there, which I could not be happier about. It's a very big deal. But coming out of that campaign, um, they really were like, we don't want to keep fighting the cops. We don't want to keep talking about how much we hate the cops. We actually want to build what we want, right? Um, and as a way of, you know, helping make the cops obsolete by building things instead of no, right? Because we spent a lot of time saying no. Um, and so one of the things that they're doing now is some research for a campaign they want to launch, and they're talking to residents across the city of Oakland about their interactions with cops, but also about where they like to spend time in the city and why, what's there, what's appealing to them, and then also if they could put resources into making the city safer, more secure, what would they build? Anything. And then the idea is to, to start to develop some community projects based on the interviews that we did with people. And then also, um, we have a brand new chapter in Portland, Oregon, and they're interviewing people across the city to learn more about the history of anti-PSC work in Portland. So we use it a lot, um, and it's um, a big part of the, the practice that, that I have in other areas, too. Um, I also want to talk about uh, murals. Part of the fight against the gang injunction um, was a cultural fight. It was a big, big component of that campaign. 
um, there are two people who were named on this injunction as blights, as nuisances, public nuisances. That's what a gang injunction does, names you as a public nuisance. Um, and these guys uh, were called the worst things by city officials. Uh, it was unbelievable. I mean, they were called the worst of the worst and the most, and menaces and all of that. But the city attorney called them bullet magnets to their faces, right, in a public setting, right? So two of these guys um, were one of, I mean, the insult to injury on this one is that one of them actually had been shot, right? And the guy didn't know that. But um, they decided that um, they were tired of all of the kind of bad talking that they were hearing about themselves. And they also were like, we know our neighbors. We want to do something in our neighborhood. We're tired of fighting them but not getting any resources. And so they decided that they wanted to collaborate with a local organization to do a series of mural projects in the, in the neighborhood where they live and it's this injunction zone that they were policing. And so they made plans to do these murals and they, done, they did, I think, ultimately a series of three or four of them. And what they were were the cultural history of the neighborhood. So there's, you know, stuff that is like Rasa's stuff all over, or history of kind of, you know, um, colonization of that part of California. There's other stuff that's like really more about the neighborhood. And then people could come from the neighborhood and paint and whatever. And they held a block party every time that they did one of these. And before they had the block party, they knocked on every single neighbor's door. And they were like, hey, we're going to have free food. We're going to have music. We'd love to have you come out and paint. And this is like the worst of the worst, the biggest menace, right? So a mural in and of itself doesn't do anything, right? Um, and a party doesn't in and of itself do anything. But the activity that they took in making it a collective process and a collective project sh was able to shift who was understood as dangerous in the neighborhood, and they became seen as community resources. So that same guy recently came out. He heard a gun go off in the neighborhood. He came out. He had gotten himself trained as a medic through some of the work we did in the coalition. He met somebody there, got his training as a community medic, and was able to give first aid to this little kid who had had some incident, right? So the part of the story of that is really just about the way that culture is also used as a bit of a centrifuge, right? To kind of bring people together and put them in motion. Um, and then the last thing that I'll just talk about is um, that we, after, uh, so many police things. After Oscar Grant was shot, um, you might know there were all kinds of activities in the streets for many, many nights there. Um, and a bunch of people, uh, right around 100 people, actually got locked up um, for activities during those nights. Um, the Oakland 100, the Beatle 100. And there were lots of court dates, obviously, for people, that many people. And so as part of what was going on, day after day after day in the streets, but also to kind of generate attention for people's court dates so that the, uh, the judge could see that there was community support for the people. Mm -hmm. um, we would, we made a series of things. We made a, a big mural, but we also made um, really, really tall signs that are based on the signs from the Mothers of the Disappeared in Argentina um, that just have somebody's face who's been shot by the cops and their name and presented on them. Um, and these things were the most amazing tools. There were, I don't know, there's like eight of them that we made. We would take them out, and every time I had one, whether I was walking in the streets in a protest or I was standing at court, I would meet somebody who knew the person mm -hmm. on my side. And there were a couple times when people didn't know that they had been killed. Mm -hmm. So they're like, why is that person on your side, right? And then you can have a different kind of conversation with people about that. But it's the visual image that draws them in to the conversation and brings them into your force of gravity in that way. And one of the things that's been really, really important to us is, as an organization, um, regardless of visual, what the visual images are, is to shift the language, the visual language that we use um, in our work. So in our stuff, you're probably never going to see razor wire. You're probably never going to see bars. You're probably never going to see cuffs, you know. We try to have, as often as possible, when we have control over the images, liberatory images. 
because it's as important for the language that we use to not be framed by our adversaries, as Jean was reminding us earlier. Um, and, and that's visual language as well, right? So if what we see are cages and cuffs and, and manacles, right, how can we think outside of that? But when we see people breaking out and, you know, dreaming and working together, I think it just shifts that a bit too, so that's part of our practice. That wasn't that brief at all. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that you, that you talked about the, the, the madres, the mothers that disappeared, because the uh, this question about art and reform, the first thing that comes to my mind is a, my colleague, Anthony Papa, who mm -hmm. is a painter and was sent to prison um, uh, under the Rockefeller drug laws, a 15-year-to-life sentence, a first-time charge, you know, the um, one of hundreds of thousands of stories, right, um, of people who were incarcerated under those laws. How many people in the room have heard of the Rockefeller drug laws? So most of the folks in the room. For those that haven't, yes, well, <laughs> we gotta move them. For those that don't know, these were laws that in New York that were passed in 1973 that that required um, uh, a, a long, long prison terms, 15 years to life, prison for even first time drug offenses, and. From 1973 to 2009, there were roughly 200,000 people incarcerated under these laws. And the people who heard of those laws, put your hands up again. So all of us who have heard of those laws, um, in part, can like owe something back to a bunch of organizers and a bunch of people who worked. But certainly to people like Anthony Papa, who while he was incarcerated, start, he learned to paint. And um, when he got out, well, his story of getting out is an amazing thing unto itself because he, he the, a very sm small snippet of his story, um, he was painting and he was determined to get out and he ended up writing news stories about himself under a pseudonym that ended up getting picked up in a paper <laughs> and he wound up getting himself written about in these art journals and kept, he is... If you know Anthony Papa, you know that he is a stubbornly focused dude, especially about his own stuff. And um, he got his painting into the Whitney Museum of Art, a self-portrait of be, having been while, while he was incarcerated. And he used that to, to leverage clemency from Governor Pataki in 1997. Now, when he got out and hit the streets, he joined up with this other artist, this guy by the name of Randy Credico, who is um, a tough, tough cookie to deal with. There's no doubt about it. Um, but Randy uh, had been a comedian doing, he, during the Nicaraguan Revolution, this, the Sandinista Revolution, Randy was going down to Managua and was doing essentially comedy to raise money for the Sandinistas. <laughs> He had a trajectory where he was supposed to be like a super hot star, but he pissed off Johnny Carson and it killed his career. Because he, was, he went on the Johnny Carson show and had made leftist jokes and had joked about Reagan and Carson basically killed his career. And so he started doing movement work. So Randy and, and Papa started, they took a page from the Madres in Argentina and they started to hold up signs of people who had been disappeared off the streets under these laws in a period of time where we weren't really, as a, as a society, questioning whether or not it was right for having somebody behind bars. If they were behind bars, they must have done something wrong. Right? And they used these tactics of direct action, confrontation, um, storytelling, um, borrowed from a South American movement in Argentina, right, that was against a dictatorship and helped bring down that dictatorship, to tell the stories of people who had been otherwise silenced. And they used art, and they used theater, and they used direct action to tell those stories. And simultaneously to them doing that, there was a really robust student movement here in New York and in California against prisons and whatnot. And students were using, they were using direct action and art and cre really creative interventions to raise the profile of these issues to the point that terms like the Rockefeller drug laws became something that a lot more people knew about. And, that, um, and then there was a whole bunch of other stuff, of course, that was going on. You know, there was all the data that was produced and the reports that showed that stuff didn't work and the court cases and all that stuff as well. But my point is that 
uh, art played a big role. So when I, you know when I moved to New York and started doing work around the Rockefeller drug laws, you know th these these folks that have been doing that work helped lead to the point in 2003, right when I moved here, when Richard Simmons, a uh, Richard, is that? Thank you. I was like, so you didn't have to tell me. I'm going to say that Richard Simmons had a role in that. He was in shape. Russell Simmons. Thank you. I knew something was wrong. I was like, ah, I know it's not right. Um, when Russell Simmons did, did his... Um, uh, countdown for fairness in 2003, right, in, in downtown New York City, at, at, down at City Hall, when he had all of these hip-hop artists come out speaking out against the Rockefeller drug laws, that had a profound impact on the political discourse in Albany and around the state. Now, it didn't immediately le need, lead to reform, and unfortunately, I think, for some of the big-time stars like Mr. Simmons, who I respect that he did that a great deal, because he didn't need to put out all his money to do that. Or put in those phone calls, you know. Um, uh, so I respect that. I also think that sometimes those folks are so they're such giants in the world that they can sometimes undervalue the role that organizing can play, because it wasn't as he learned. It wasn't just sufficient for him to speak out with Fifty Cent, and Eminem, and Jay Z to change the laws. It took that in combination with organizing. But my point is that, um, particularly with this stuff, particularly with stuff around prisons and and mass incarceration and the drug laws, the art has played a really essential role, even if it's the most basic part of, of what I think a, an artistic experience could be, which is about storytelling. It's like no good advocate worth their salt or no good organizer worth their salt goes to a meeting to change a law without bringing somebody who's had an experience that can tell their story in their own voice. Because nobody cares. That, I mean, I don't want to overstate this, but in essence, it's like no law got changed because somebody issued a report. I'd like that to be the case. It would make everybody's lives easier to some extent, but because we got all the data to show that what's working and not working, but it really does take this very human, this very fundamental thing, and 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 people telling their stories is such a powerful, powerful part about that. And nobody can tell someone's story better than themselves, and when they do it in a fashion that can help illustrate all the stuff that the data is saying, but in a human form and connect on that heart-to-heart -heart level. It makes things, it makes a world a difference. And, and I, uh, so I have a, I, when RJ was talking about the box, how many people here saw the box? So a lot of y'all saw the box. I, I unfortunately missed it. I mean, I remember RJ talking about that show. Like, I don't know when that was, RJ, but it was a while ago. It was on the train. And he's like, oh, we're going to do this thing. He was talking about it, you know. That kind of stuff is so important to this mix of things, you know, because you need it to help us think and dream differently. Right? I think it helps us dream, like the art, that the artistic engagement helps us dream differently. So it's certainly been an important part of my trajectory, and I owe great debt um, to artists like Tony Pop or Randy Predico or, 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 and many, many others, right, who've helped both shape the world I, I work in, but also given me a lot to work with. Mm -hmm. Can I add something yeah, sure. that you just made me think of, Gabriel, which is it also prevents invisibility. Mm -hmm. yeah, right? That's right. Like these systems are mm -hmm. meant to make people socially dead, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And so, I mean, the, there's a way that the the stories, both the stories people tell about themselves, right, but also the ability for us then to generalize them across different experiences, mm -hmm. right? So why it's really important that stories get um, translated into pieces of theater or into poetry or into film or you know whatever the case might be, and that's what's really powerful about the work you all are doing with these you know, profiles of people, right? Is that, you know, it's designed to make us invisible and alienated and silent, right? And that those stories, I really appreciated the way that you told that, because it's like, no, it prevents us from being silent. It prevents us from being invisible. I think I also want to add that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process moment for us, too. But it's not just, I feel like what's been so impactful of the stories you've told, the stories you've told, any of the examples of inspirational art and culture within our movements is that it's not just what that one product is, but it's the process of retelling that story, or it's the process of that mural being on the corner, and people still going by that corner and talking about what just happened to them. Yeah. And it's the process of folks being transformed on a daily basis, being able to have a common communication piece mm -hmm. that we just don't often have. 
So I feel like that's the longevity of the process of really good art is part of what actually helps us move movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's really important to underscore. They can't can't underscore that enough. That process piece, and in a lot of ways, that's the sort of exact opposite of this neoliberal capitalism, where in punitive justice is you do something wrong, and there's something you know, then there's a response for that, but there's no acknowledgement of process, and also a challenge for our movements that many of us you know have spoken to is a, not a deep enough recognition of the process of of <laughs> the evolution. Yeah. So I'd love to invite some some questions um, from you all. Um, we're going to take about three questions, you know, stack them up, and uh, point them to, uh, to these folks. And uh, also, I forgot to tell you all beforehand, uh, but I'm all, I also want to invite, if any of you all have questions for each other, we'll, we'll stick those in our, in our stack as we go <laughs> along. Um, now you all know. Um, but if there's any questions that any of, any of you all have, is that a question? Yeah, it's a question. I just, I, I, I don't want to. I think we st okay. Judith? Judith, you have a question. I spent a lot of work in prisons. I know Tony really well. And um, do, do you see, you know, I'm, I'm impressed by all of your comments about the convergence of all the different things that help change language or change the law, right? The activism. And do you see, um, are you doing things in prisons also? I mean, I was just thinking about some corrections officers that I know and being at Bedford Hills and what that's like in a maximum security women's prison and seeing the women that continually on a weekly basis do these incredible art and teaching projects. And you, know, you can't bring everybody into a prison, um, but you can kind of bring the story out so that Um, I, I want to take two two more. We'll, we'll stack those up. I, I'm not sure if everyone heard that question, but if I if correct me if I rephrase if I'm rephrasing it right, but it was a question about um, working inside. If you do any work inside prison and the role of art in in that work inside um, and that relationship between those in, that inside work and the outside community. Um, is there any other questions? Yes. Um, I guess you know everything you guys spoke about is something I feel passionate about, but. How did you engage students to be part of this conversation? Because a lot of the time, the students that I find are interested in these topics end up being all very in one major, so it'd be like either in political science or sociology, and they, they want to concentrate. But this is something that, in my opinion, affects so many facets, so many different like disciplines. That, we, and a lot of the time when we tell them, like you know, like for example, I'm a chapter lead for students for sensible drug policies on my cap college campus. And when I tell kids, like, okay, like, these are the, the history of the drug war. This is what's going on. These are the injustices happening. They're scared, and it kind of the chilling effect that you spoke about of the state. They're scared to put their name on a piece of paper mm -hmm. in support of something that's right. And they, and they themselves may be drug users. They themselves may, you know, be along that line. But they are afraid to put their name because, you know, and rightfully so, you know, NSA revelations and whatnot. But they're scared to I guess sign the dotted line and say, you know, I support changing this, even though, even if they may not be themselves drug users or may never encounter the prison system, and they know the injustice is going on, mm -hmm. they are afraid to say and to stand up and speak up. And you know, it's important to get people like ourselves in this room talking about it. But I think really making it a national conversation that spans, you know, beyond just us is important as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. But acknowledge that this is also beautiful. That's a multi generational conversation <laughs> alone in this room. Um, so I give thanks for that. Do you have? Yeah, I actually have two questions. One brief one, mm -hmm. and that is, um, Gabriel. I wonder if you could. Are, are you trying to shift? You had said at the beginning of this whole thing that um, that rehab and treatment isn't mm -hmm. necessarily the isn't what's useful. And so are you trying to shift the frame in some way, or how are you trying to shift the frame away from rehab and treatment as the quick fix that people, or not so quick? That was a, that's a brief question, the longer question. It has to do with um, 
this idea of 40 years or time or process, it, just bear with me for one second because it's not, I have to say a couple of things to get to find my way to the question. But suffice it to say that I, I think I, I was really excited to hear people define movement. And I, and everybody talks about movement. All of you talked about movement in terms of winning and losing. Or winning. That if. <laughs> We're not moving. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> and, and so to. Uh, which is, which is, I mean, why wouldn't we want to win certain things or abolish certain things or etc. The thing that I puzzle with myself all the time is this idea of movement being attached to those goals versus a, some sort of ecological understanding of the work that we do that sort of never ends. Mm -hmm. Because to win something, like I remember when the DW, when DW, when they finally changed the, the domestic workers law, there was just a whole ton of things to do after that. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, we won, hooray! I mean, <laughs> you know, there was like, and so this idea of movement being attached to winning, this idea even of art being stories and attached to movement building as opposed to something that also happens simultaneously in a sort of ecology that is not only a tool. All this to ask, do you ever struggle with the notion of movement, or not even struggle, but wonder whether there's another way for us to think of ourselves organized? Sorry that took so long. Thank you. Start? Yeah. Sure. Um, all right. Yes, working with prisoners um, is very important. Um, we don't run a lot of pr a lot of programming inside of prisons because it's really difficult to do that. Most everywhere, um, the largest number of our people in California is just like not going to happen. Like there's a media ban in California. You know that you, you're not getting into the programming in the same way, even that you can in New York State. With some exceptions, like San Quentin has some community programs and that kind of thing. That being said, um, you know we have worked with uh, prisoner organizers since our beginning, um, and we do that in a variety of ways. We have a prisoner correspondence program that is not really a pen pal program, but it, it's much more like resources, helping support, organizing on the inside by amplifying stuff outside or figuring out what we can do that won't wind up somebody in the hole and can support the work that they're doing inside. Um, we uh, p produce a publication called The Abolitionist that um, is written, is put together by imprisoned people and non-imprisoned people um, and circulates to about 3,500 imprisoned people across the United States for free. So if you know somebody inside who wants one, come holler at me. Um, and you know that again is a is a tool. In, in so many places, communication is really really difficult. Getting political analysis inside is really really difficult. The vast majority of what people have access to is pretty garbagey. You know, so trying to figure out how to do that. And then there are um, specific campaign instances too. And the most recent one is. Um, you know, the work that we did on the outside to support uh, the five demands of people that went on hunger strike in the California prison system. So July of this year was the third round of hunger strikes to protest the use of solitary confinement and the conditions of solitary confinement. Um, 30,000 people, imprisoned people, went out on strike. This is a, I mean, it's crazy to say 30,000 people, and it's like, that wasn't everybody in the California system, yeah. right? <laughs> but 30,000 people um, went on hunger strike, work stoppage, or program stoppage um, in California, California prisons. Um, depending on who you ask, the prison system itself says upwards of 100 or more people stayed on strike for 60 full days, on hunger strike for 60 days. So as a bit of context for that, those of you who know Bobby Sands, he was on strike for 66 days. That's a very, very long time to go without eating. Um, and the spark for that work came actually, you know, in early 2000, late 2010, early 2011, when a collective group of people imprisoned in Pelican Bay prison, which is was designed to be 
a, con a solitary confinement prison, um, put out a statement saying that they were going to go on hunger strike to a couple organizations, to a, a paper in the Bay Area that publishes that kind of stuff, and to some of their loved ones saying, we're going to go out on strike if the conditions in here don't change, if we can't get some basic demands met. And so organizations, individuals across the state started talking to each other about how to do support on the outside. And so this last round of strikes um, also won a couple things that were pretty key. They won uh, through organizing pressure inside and outside. Um, two hearings, legislative hearings, so the committees of the public safety committees on conditions and pieces of legislation came out of those hearings meant to change conditions in the ship. Or I'm sorry, in, in solitary confinement. So that's, and, and that has been ongoing work. That happens through visits, through letters. And just as like a, a piece of context, these are organizers who are in like just severe isolation. They are in 23 hour a day lockdown in a space that's roughly the size of your bathroom um, without human contact apart from guards. So like if they get a legal visit, they get moved into a cage, that's a chair cage, and they get to see their lawyer that way, right? Or they get wide plexiglass and a phone, right? And they managed to organize inside, not only to come up with these demands, but with statements of political unity. At the end of the strikes in 2011, they issued um, an agreement to end racial hostilities in the prison system that they circulated throughout the entire system that was about trying to figure out how to remedy differences across racial lines, which just get stoked inside of prison systems like you wouldn't believe, inside but also outside, right? So end your hostilities on the outside. There are all different kinds of ways that we can do this resolution. And these are organizers who are organizing under those conditions with support of their loved ones, with support of organizations. So that was very long. Then, um, I don't, I'm gonna leave the, the student one for you all to talk about. And then, what was the other one? There was something I wanted to say. Oh, well we said win because Michael asked us, <laughs> what does winning mean, right? No, we asked what a movement was. The first question was what a movement was. Yeah, but but then you asked us directly, what does winning look like, mm -hmm. right? And um, I actually appreciated how you, how you framed it, because that is actually how we think about um, operating inside of movements. And I actually think it's a very, very, um, I'm, I'm held up by the sense of movement. I don't find it confining. I think it's actually, it, it helps us think like we're not alone, right? But I really appreciate you describing it as an ecology because I think it really is. We understand that different people, different organizations, different issue areas have to play different roles, right? And at different times. And as an organization that has fairly radical politics, that's actually really important for us to carve out what is a good role for us, right? We want to operate in collaboration. We don't want to have to compromise our politics, but we also don't want to do that at the expense of everybody else around us because we're all in this together for the long haul, right? And so sometimes the role that we play is to say the thing that nobody else can say because okay. then, you know, <laughs> they lose access to whatever. And we, need, we both need mm -hmm. those sides. Sometimes the role is for us to take a back seat, right? And not be the kind of leading role. And so I, I appreciate your framing it like that because I think it's, it's really true. Yeah, I would agree with um, that. I, I don't think it's an either or. I don't think it's a binary of win right. versus ecology. Um, and I would guess that you don't think that either. Right. I think we're probably pretty unified in that. And I think that, for me, part of it is that um, I would want us to be humble enough that even if we did a four-decade plan, to assume that it's not comprehensive. <laughs> to assume that we that we're that the conditions will change as we go. There needs to be readjustments, and hopefully, there are things that we can't even imagine that's just beautiful and joyful that come out of that. Um, and that kind of humility, I think, in a movement where there's actually different actors working on different strategies, but in some level of coordination, I feel like is what our power can be as, as large, large groups of people. Um, the other thing is I think that for, I feel like every uh, justice movement victory, quote unquote, 
always gets met by resistance, mm -hmm. right? And always gets, uh, there's always an attempt to roll back. So I think that, and, and I also think that sometimes on the left, we don't like to claim that we're going to try to win. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we need to try to win sometimes. <laughs> so that doesn't mean win means just this small box. It means, like, let's imagine what that looks like. Sometimes it means this piece today and this much broader piece tomorrow, or vice versa, but that we actually give ourselves permission to imagine that we actually have the power with our neighbors, with our families, to actually change conditions. Um, and for me, that's actually what I mean by winning, not necessarily what that final product looks like, because I don't know what that looks like, but I know that what it means is that all of us are moving forward together. Um, the, the, I'm going to let Gabriel answer um, uh, just like uh, Rachel did in terms of the first question, because for Community Tonight for Police Reform, we're pretty focused on police accountability, although a number of our individual member groups do work. Um, for example, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement does a lot of work with political prisoners. Uh, families for Freedom does a lot of work uh, with families who have members um, in detention centers. Um, Center for Constitutional Rights did some litigation around some of the hunger strikes in prisons. And so there's a lot of work that individual groups do, but as a campaign, we're pretty focused on NYPD accountability, because, um, you know, that's not enough work. Um, yes. um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to leave you with a student one, too. All right. I, uh, I don't know how, um, I've not been a student in an undergrad in first for a while, and so I can't, I don't know how to organize students. I, I have some experience in organizing campaigns, and, um, and I think that there's some, some fairly basic fundamental uh, campaign practices that are about finding a good issue that cuts across different constituencies and figuring out how to develop the right kind of campaign that can bring in people um, and that can generate some fire and heat um, to grow the number of people who are involved and that kind of stuff. S some of those are just like fundamental building blocks that everyone who works on campaigns then takes and has to apply in their own context, in their own political environment, in their own social environment. So like, I, I wish that I had the like, here's what you do, I don't have that. Um, but I'd be happy to talk with you about if there's something that we could do um, around, like as Drug Policy Alliance or other folks we work with, to support your efforts. That's, so there's that. Um, and just one thing about student organizing, I, when, when I was a late, um, uh, I went to undergrad, so very late, later in my life, traditional. I was not a non-traditional student, I guess that's what they say. And one of the one of the ways I decided to go to uh, what the school I went to was that the the year before the the students for their um, graduation speaker they organized to have Lumia mm -hmm. as their graduation speaker, and is this was in <laughs> Olympia, Washington, and they organized and so Lumia recorded something. Lumia, for those that don't know, is a political prisoner held for uh, go. I mean, geez, over thirty five years now, I guess. Um, for, for an alleged murder of a police officer, of which he's maintained his innocence, and there's a great amount of evidence that suggests he was not the, the, um, the, the person who, who committed the crime, and in fact, the Philly PD had roped him into this thing. In any event, they organized to get him as the speaker, and I, and I heard this and followed this on the radio, and I was like, I'm going where those folks are. But they, um, they spent a lot of time organizing, and they had, actually, the governor tried to shut it down and all of this stuff, and they... Some lessons in that for me were about how, like issue selection and solidarity and all sorts of stuff that I'd love to talk about with you or other folks. Um, the point is that student organizing has had a big impact on me. Uh, I have a great debt to my, my political development to it. Um, with respect to just briefly on the on the rehab and treatment question, I think you know, in a sign of a shifting political environment. Uh, 14 years ago, uh, when when California passed Proposition 36, right? It was a it was a treatment instead of incarceration initiative. Mm -hmm. It was like let's stop locking people up instead of putting them in prison, give them treatment. And at that time, that was a that was a um, a progressive notion, to say the least, because it was not happening around the country. And and that notion, that claim of like treatment instead of incarceration was a helpful sort of p way to pierce this notion that the solution for everything was just going to be to lock people up. And that's what we were doing. 
right? Not everybody, of course. It was like low-income folks, folks of color. As you can note, it like the social infrastructure wiped out. So you're homeless, you're gonna locked up. You're poor, you're gonna lock you up. You're, you know, like that was the way to do it. I think we're really past this time of treatment instead of incarceration. And and one of the things that is for me a signal of alarm is that this group right on crime which are the same, excuse the French, um, assholes who, no, it wasn't, it was, this was, a, the prison system we have today was a bipartisan effort through and through, no doubt. Yeah. But a lot of the knuckleheads who helped establish the ideological framework that formed the basis, the, the foundational basis for how it is that we got into this mess are now like proclaiming themselves to be the ones who are going to get it out, uh, us out of this, which I think is the height of hypocrisy. But those knuckleheads are saying, oh, you know, we should have treatment instead of incarceration. Right? And, and that coupled with the fact that now treatment instead of incarceration is a far more appropriate thing for liberals to latch on to. Yeah. And liberals have been amongst the worst. Like, talk about some knuckleheads. And, you know, that is an alarming thing to me. And the reason for that is what it suggests is that there's, that there's something appropriate about how people got into the criminal justice system in the first place for a drug offense. And that now the only question is, should we be putting them in, in a jail cell or into treatment? And it doesn't question the notion that, heck, you know, maybe the person doesn't have a problem. Maybe the problem is that they live in a community that's targeted by the police for... Uh, uh, like in stop and frisk practice. Like the number one arrest in New York City, well now number two, is for marijuana possession. And 85% of the people arrested for marijuana possession in this city are black and Latino. And the vast majority of them are young men of color, even though it's young white men who are far more likely to be using marijuana. And so the, the logical conclusion when you take out the rehab, you know, like treatments of incarceration, it, it justifies the notion of the very arrest to begin with. Like what about... No arrest for any drug offense at all. How's that? Yeah. Or possession offenses. We'll start there for those who might feel a little uncomfortable at the notion of sales. Keep in mind that if you pass a joint to somebody in this state, you're a drug dealer by definition of the penal code. That's the law. right? If you pass a joint and you share, you're, you're, you're sa that's a sales offense. The penal law defies you as a drug dealer. But if you're uncomfortable with that notion, let's just start with possession and use. Well, we, instead of saying treatment instead of incarceration, we said no arrest for the possession of any drug. Right. Heroin, cocaine, LSD, marijuana, no arrest at all. Why? It was like, well, why would you arrest them? What are we going to do? And, it's, and like, really, what is the value? What is the public safety value? And in 40 years of doing this stuff, there's almost nothing in the, in the literature that suggests that these practices have any benefit for public safety. It's hard to find something that's not a bunch of BS, right? And so I, that's why I think it's, it's not that people don't need help. Trust me, there's a lot of people who do need some form of treatment and help. And I'm not knocking those people that do at all. We should take great care to make sure that for those folks that need some help, they get it. I mean, I'm sure all of us probably either have someone in our family or maybe it was us ourselves or we know somebody who's like the uncle who drinks you wish does not start drinking on Thanksgiving, but they do anyways, right? It's like the family member who's got some other problem, like the person who's just, their drug use is an issue for them. We all, we've been those people or we know. And those folks should get the assistance that they need. But the, but the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of people who use drugs don't have a problem. And until we start to be honest about that fact, the notion of treatment instead of incarceration suggests that the mere use of a drug is a problem. And, the, and then what we're gonna debate is like, what should we do? We're gonna mandate that that person goes to some treatment which, by the way, the vast majority of treatment programs are utterly BS. There's very little evidence for their efficacy, right? They tend, to, they tend to define success as whether or not someone is abstinent, right? Six to 12 months after the end of the treatment course. It says nothing about how the person is in their life. There's a lot of there's a whole, big people can use drugs and take care of their kids and go to work and all kinds of things. Like the, a real a more fundamental question is, is the person stabilized enough where they can deal with their responsibilities effectively? Do they feel a sense of joy? Do they have connection with their self-worth? Whether they're using drugs or not shouldn't be a point. So obviously, there's a long answer because like, this is a big thing for me. Um, 
<laughs> Clearly. <laughs> and it's hard, you know, le legislatively it's quite difficult because, you know, there's a certain, Ra Rachel's talking about what's possible. You know, within a legislative context, what's possible, I'll tell you, it's not, I don't want to say it's not possible. It is a challenge to try to advance a legislative agenda that where we're saying, how about we don't arrest any, anybody for any drug possession offense in an environment where we're still arguing with elected officials about the fact that these 50,000 marijuana possession offense, uh, or possession arrests are totally against the existing law that we have on the books. We're just trying to fix the existing law and that'll change it. With respect, br very briefly, to the ecology, I like that term a lot about movement stuff um, and, and winning. What I like to think about winning a lot, like as I like, I want to win. The the I do, and and any but any of us, anybody who's tried to change any policy, knows that um, that in the in the effort to do so, the vast majority of your time, if you're defining the victory as whether or not you change the law, then most of your time is spent losing. Right? It's like, I have become a fantastic loser. Like, I, we've, we've spent more time losing it under that definition than anything else. We lose all the damn time. If you need something lost, come and talk to me. <laughs> and and it's, it's why we have to be careful how we define the win. Right? Because there is a, there is a point where we're like, we want to pass, pass the law. Like, we want to win the lawsuit. We wanna, those are important benchmarks. I'm not knocking them at all. But there's a whole range of other benchmarks, too. And Rachel, you were sort of hitting on it earlier, like the profession, professionalization of the movement. It's like, to the extent that the funding apparatus is, I don't want to get us too far off, but to the extent that the funding apparatus begins to shape how we define victory, and then it's like, did you get your bill passed or not? It's like, well, no, because it takes a long time to do that. But I guess what, we did all this other stuff that's actually really a part about that movement did, in, ecology, right, and that infrastructure. And it's like why we work with grassroots organizations as DPA, it's like, you know, we don't, we don't only define it by did we get the bill passed. We say like, did we, are there more leaders at stake here? Are there more members involved? Are there more people talking about this thing? Like, there's a whole other set of metrics to use here to define whether or not we won that I think inform and shape and help build that ecology and that, um, and will hopefully get us to the place of actually having bigger wins, which I would very much like, um, like to see. I wish we had so much more time. Me too. Is there any other questions? Take like. Not only to each other, but also to people around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in the military, this is a real pay rent, for instance. Um, you know, with what happens right now, uh, with the expansion of the military into the Philippines, for instance. Like, how can we reconcile that? And um, from within the empire, for people who are working on issues mm -hmm. of surveillance and policing and state violence, mm -hmm. nation state violence, how can we be in solidarity with people around the world? And how can we connect the work that we do um, to the experience? I guess my primary question for this distinguished panel is <clears throat> in the wake of, in the interim, while we are um, waiting for some closure in the Ron Molly Graham case, we're also approaching a time when our kids are going to get out of school. Um, what can we do when we, not only as audience here, but as a group, as picture owners, what can we do to press or push the, the Justice Department 
Department of Justice into giving us some clear kind of guidelines that we can kind of wrap or wrap ourselves around about how safe are our kids going to be coming from the corner store. Um, what is a federal judge just said that in communities of color, there's rampant uh, um, denial of Fourth Amendment rights. There's a Fourth Amendment right attached to the, this case. Yep. Uh, their officer has to have the right to go into that house. It's not like this kid was going down the subway. He was in this house. So what was that? Um, where's this question about a crime has been or is about to be committed reasonable suspicion? I mean, this is a test case that the community don't push the Department of Justice to give us some clear, some clear distinctions about what's right, what's wrong, and where are the perimeters. Um, we need this before our kids get out of school. Yeah. We, we really, and, 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 and I'm here, I came here primarily to get, what do we do to push the Justice Department to giving that family closure and to giving us clarity before our kids get out of school and we see so many more potential Ramali Gray. Mm -hmm. uh, last one. Uh, somebody said revolution back here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't feel like, um, I mean, you've laid it out, but I feel like it's important to say that, like, in each of your respective areas of work, um, what's been accomplished in the movements that you're part of is really significant. Like, it's what, what you laid out in terms of where we've moved around the drug war is huge. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that um, we wouldn't have the Blasio administration actually if stop and frisk hadn't become a public issue. And the work of CTR was central to that, which is potentially going to change the landscape of, of mayorship here, right? I mean, we had two, two terms of Giuliani, three of Bloomberg. Um, it's the first time somebody that's nominally progressive is in office here in a long time. Um, and appointed uh, chief of police Brack, right? Which, interestingly enough, in Oakland, um, the work that Rachel's a part of actually pushed Bratton out of Oakland. Based, ish. Ish, based on based on his, you know, based on his prior behavior um, in other places. I say all that just to say that, like, this is this current kind of new context in New York City. I'm a little bit curious about how you relate to de Blasio, how you relate to Bratton, what your thoughts are, Rachel, about Bratton. Um, yeah, that's my question. Not that's <laughs> <laughs> Before we, we dig in that, too, I'm just going to encourage you, you know, in the interest of time, you don't necessarily feel like we had to answer all those questions, although there was one, the global question, some interest from all of you, so, but the other two, you know, you don't need to feel obligated to answer all three. <laughs> but feel free to if you'd like, <laughs> by all means. Yeah. Maybe they don't want to ask yeah, you. Yeah, no, I, I, I will. Um, the international question is a big one, and I think I, I, I should probably just mention, because of the role of the war on drugs so much, uh, or that has played such a, uh, and continues to play such a, a huge um, role as a vehicle for militarization in the global south and around the, around the world. Uh, I don't know how to best make the connections between local work and international work. I know that in I know that making those connections at times has proven to be very powerful in my own experience and from some of the history that I'm aware of. And I think that there's a lot to be said for creating a, um, awareness at the very local level for people to understand how it is that extremely local um, issues are connected to very global circumstances. And that it's, um, so when I think about stop and frisk as an example, um, it, it's, 
we don't, we, we, it, it may not be a, a polite, it, we may not be able to say in polite company that it's a police state kind of activity. It's easier to say that Iran has a police state to justify, you know, us rattling the sabers or that, you know, that Putin is, a, you know, a, a tyrant, you know, for, for seizing Crimea. Um, but I, I would submit that if we were to, I mean, as we've done, but or people here have done, but if we were to just go around and ask people who have been the subject of the practices of stop and frisk, the responses that we got, if we were to lay them out for responses to people in other parts of the world, we'd pro probably find them to be pretty similar in states that we charge as being police states. And I think, it, I find as an organizer that it's useful to get folks to connect with the local discussion about what's happening and to, and to build out from there to understand the linkages to global factors so that people have a basis for an authentic solidarity. And that, uh, it, that I think, coupled with doing the kind of solidarity work where folks are actually going to other countries and, and bearing witness and taking part in local struggles with, at the invitation of folks from other parts of the world and bringing that back and sharing that has, has certainly had a profound impact on me and my own work and I think um, uh, continues to shape a lot of the different organizing struggles that I am either connected to or follow quite closely. So, you know, I think there is a real responsibility to, to have that global context there in, in an increasingly global world. I personally think that we're going to find, uh, uh, as if, particularly in efforts around the uh, drug efforts, that there's going to be an increasing global conversation around this upcoming UN meeting that's happening here in the U.S. in 2016 called UNGAS, where questions around drug policy at the global level will really be a, a subject of discussion, an international discussion, and the role of the United States in maintaining the system of drug prohibition at the global level, which creates a, 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 just, a system of justification for militarization, for things that are happening everywhere from Afghanistan to Mexico. Uh, we have a really unique opportunity to engage that in a, in a way that we don't, uh, well, in terms of the UN, only comes around once every 10 years. So uh, that's an opportunity we're certainly looking at and trying to brainstorm now about best ways to take global issues, particularly on the UN, which is not always the most exciting thing. I mean, we, in this country, we completely ignore everything to do with the UN um, because we're in violation of nearly every freaking treaty that exists with it, right? Um, but I think it's an opportunity for us to, to engage and... Um, uh, and I'm hoping that we're able to do so in a way that, that builds stronger ties with organizers in other parts of the world and where we can, our work can be informed at the local level by some of those struggles. And that may not be as, I wish I had a more succinct answer about it. And it, maybe you have other, pe other people have ideas about this stuff, but I, it's certainly something I feel very acutely aware of all the time. And I think it's a, um, um, one of uh, a constant state of a, a dynamic tension. I think what I would add is, um, uh, is two things to that question around the global piece. One is that um, if we look at New York City, there are a number of neighborhoods where community residents would say that they've been under occupation. Um, and that hasn't changed. Uh, even though stops are down significantly, it's still more than double the first year Bloomberg took office. The racial disparities are still pretty much exactly the same as they've been for the past dozen years. And so we've had some important shift in conditions because it's good that the number of stops are down. Um, that's not a bad thing, but we've got to actually do better. So that's one piece. And for me, we have to connect the local to the global. And the, the second piece of that for me that, I mean, this is like a two hour long conversation, right? Which we're not gonna do right now. But <laughs> the second piece of that for me that I always keep in my heart is that um, a good friend of mine um, from El Salvador, uh, Marta Benavides, used to say when she was asked um, by Americans what kind of solidarity work would be helpful, what she used to say is hold your government accountable. Like that's your solidarity work. Don't think about helping us, hold your government accountable. And so for us, I feel like our task is, regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, regardless of whether or not you believe in electoral politics, we have a task in this country to hold it more accountable than it's being held, um, in whatever way that looks like. And so, just to skip uh, gears a little bit to the Ramarley Graham question, 
there's a campaign around this right now to make sure that we get the DOJ to convene a grand jury on federal civil rights charges um, and, uh, you know, ideally move on that. It's incredibly difficult because the DOJ almost never comes into New York or other places to do this kind of thing. In fact, the last time I can remember them doing it in New York, well, probably two times. One was maybe around Louima, and before that was Anthony Bias. Um, the good thing is the Anthony Baez case, uh, a lot of the organizing was led by the Justice Committee, which at that point used to be called the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights. Um, they're also helping to lead this work around with Marley. And so there's actually a number of activities coming up in the next few weeks that we should talk about separate from here. And anybody who wants to, happy to talk about it. I just don't want to do it on camera in a big room. Um, and then um, on the de Blasio Bratton question, I feel like that's a five hour conversation. Um, <laughs> but what I will start by saying, I think, is that we're in a moment of opportunity, challenge, and contradiction. Meaning that <laughs> it's kind of like the victory question, right? Like some people saw it as a victory in terms of who was elected, um, and others and many people saw it as that's a reflection of people's power. That doesn't mean that we won. Um, and that doesn't mean that conditions permanently change. It doesn't mean that there has been policy change yet on policing. It's our job as a movement to hold him accountable, the administration accountable, to what they said that they would do. So when the MTA and the NYPD said that they were going to do a sweep of homeless people off of the E-train, picture the homeless, organize people across the city, um, work with some of us within Community Night for Police Reform to do an inside-outside strategy where some people pushed on the administration privately, some people did, and some of the same people also did stuff on the outside. Um, they canceled that E-Line uh, project in terms of their quote-unquote sweep of homeless people, which doesn't mean that they're not going to continue to target homeless people. But it means that we have to claim these victories as we get them, because part of what we need to build movement is to make sure that there's something that we believe we can, we can change. And I don't mean false hope of change. I mean, we yeah, actually were right. able to change yes. that. We were yeah, able to stop it right. in its yeah. tracks because of the leadership of groups like Picture the Homeless and because people were looking out for each other. Um, so the other piece on Bratton, I've got many, many opinions, but because um, I, you know, I also remember Bratton here in the mid-90s and the families of um, Anthony Baez, Nicholas Hayward, um, Hilton Vega, Anthony Rosario, Yongshin Huang, they all remember Bratton from the mid-90s. Um, and what I want us to remember, though, is that the NYPD and the systematic um, discrimination and abuse of our communities is not about one person. It's never about one position. And in some ways, some of that becomes a distraction from us actually looking at the system of practices, that we actually have to address the system of practices regardless of who the commissioner is. So we could have had somebody who was a commissioner that maybe lots and lots and lots more people would have, I don't know. But either way, it's still the NYPD. It's going to take us a very long time mm -hmm. to change this piece. Yeah, that's a great um, way to And it. we've got a lot of work to do. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm getting like a thousand ideas trying to get out of my mouth at one time. Um, I, I completely agree with that. And I think, you know, both fans, right? And I, I'm going to talk about Bratton as a way of talking about the internet. I actually think it's like a perfect little nugget to do those things. Um, you know, I guess from from where I stand inside of my organization, not only is it one person, but that's what policing is. That is the practice of policing. The practice of policing is containment and control and suppression of dissent. That's what it is, right? So it doesn't matter if it's Bill Bratton or Ray Kelly or me, right? <laughs> you know, at some level. Right? If the practice is the practice of containment and control and suppression of dissent, right? if you do policing in that way. Um, which is not to say we don't fight for change and we don't try to chip away and we don't take incremental steps. It's not to say that at all. But it is to say don't get fooled. right? Don't get fooled by the face or the name. <clears throat> that being said, you know, I think Bratton is a really, really evil, evil man. I think, I mean, in the sense of like his impact around the world. I don't know what he does in his personal life, but his impact in the world um, has wrought havoc and misery on hundreds and millions of people at this point. And part of the reason that I think it's important to talk about him is that he is the architect and number one salesman of a very particular brand of police. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. And so, 
this kind of zero tolerance, so-called quality of life, hyper-militarized policing that is becoming the standard of policing around the world, yeah, right, uh -huh. has a lot to do with him. Uh -huh. I want to give him full credit yeah, yeah. for anything, <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but it has a lot to do with him. And, you know, the fact of uh, him moving from here, like using New York as a petri dish and perfecting that style of policing here, and then taking it to Los Angeles and just like cranking it up, right? Um, and then saying, hey, I got this recipe book for how to, you know, really, really keep shit under control, right? And I'm gonna sell it to Israel, and I'm gonna sell it to Colombia, and I'm gonna sell it to Brazil, right? I mean, a example, a couple years ago, um, you know, I was bad-mouthing Breton somewhere, I can't remember. And people from Brazil came up, and they're like, oh, we want to talk to you because we're prepping, because they brought him in to clean up Rio mm -hmm. before the Olympics and the World Cup and all these like, big mega events that are coming, right? And he's already starting. This was like two or three years ago, mm -hmm. right? He's already starting, so they're putting sweeps at like all the stuff he does, right? Sweeps. Stop and search, um, you know, different kind of comp stat training, right? Uh, comp, stat da uh, comp stat data collection. Um, and so his method is very, very honed at this point, and it is um, used internationally. And so the kind of uh, uniformity at some level that we're starting to see in how policing happens across different geographies and inside of different nation states is terrifying to me. It's completely terrifying to me because it is so pernicious and it's really precise in a lot of ways. I think that there are all kinds of ways because human beings have to implement this stuff that we can poke holes and fight and stick in and we do resist and we do win, right? So while we didn't push him out entirely, we were able to, in Oakland, cast enough doubt on his expertise, right? that the city said they wouldn't allow him contact with any residents of Oakland. He was meant to do like a series of public events as part of his contract. And they're like, we're taking all of that stuff off the table and we never saw him once. So he stayed on the contract, right? But the fact of public outcry around that shifted the terms of his contract. And it also let, um, <coughs> It created a, an environment in which it's not the word of God when Bill Bratton says something, right? So the report they submitted, the cops were like, woefully inadequate. This is a bad report. Tell, you know, this is just like consultant BS, right? And that is a very different thing from other, you know, situations in which I've, I've encountered people talking about Bratton. So, it, yeah, I mean, I think he's pernicious, but I also think he, we can beat them, you know? And, and these wins, when we tell ourselves that we win, they also see that we win something and that we're not afraid to keep coming back. And I think that's why it's incredibly important to, to claim those wins and get them back. Thank you. Thank you. So, we've been here for a little while, and uh, I think maybe it's time for us to break and you know talk more directly to, ourself, to, our, to ourselves here. Um, but, um, <laughs> right. Um, before we do, I, you know, I wanted to, if there was any like one or two comments or not necessarily questions, but anything else that I'm burning anyone wanted to just bring into the air or give thanks to or, or honor, I wanted to allow that. Cool. Michael, can we honor the term abolitionist, which I just yeah, think is sure. genius? Yeah. Give it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Especially too, I'd also be remiss to, to not acknowledge that today is the birth of Malcolm X yes. as well in this conversation about abolition. Um, so I want to just give thanks to that and uh, give thanks to the work that you guys do. Um, uh, I appreciate you for taking the time to sit and build, and I appreciate y'all for coming here to continue to build with us. Um, I don't know if there's anything from the Foundry about any upcoming events or anything you all want to speak to or plug or... Wednesday. Yeah, so uh, Wednesday will be our final dialogue in the series, um, and it's called Transforming Justice. 
and we'll be meeting with um, Miriam Kaba from Chicago, who's really at the center of the